right. Welcome back to the Team Coaching Zone podcast this week. And for our team coaching learning conversation, we have Melissa Sayer back from, I think, a great couple of weeks of vacation. Is that oh, right, Melissa? Absolutely. Absolutely fantastic. So two weeks in Florida. I was just telling Gabe, oh. had such a such an amazing time, super weather. <laughs> And yeah, I'm certainly missing St. Pete's Beach today. I can tell you that much. You deserved all the good weather you got. <laughs> well, welcome Thank back. You. And uh, you were in Gabe's home court. So we have Gabe Abella returning to the show. He's been on uh, multiple times with Gabe Abella. Uh, and uh, I think you're in Florida, but you're on your way to Ireland pretty soon. We have a U.S. Ireland connection going we on. We do. Yeah. Day, but I think um, yeah. I'm the only one who ha- I've only transited through Ireland. So I'm due for. Uh, a stay there. But uh, Gabe, you're in um, Tampa or where are you today? Yeah, I'm in Tampa, Florida today. Um, okay. And uh, Chris, sir, just great to see you and Melissa and my colleague, Stephen, which we'll get to in a moment. But uh, yeah. Yeah, it's been a while since we talked in this forum. So it's, I'm kind of excited to yeah. have a nice emergent conversation with you guys. Exactly. Great to have you back. And Stephen McDonald, first time in the team coaching zone. Good to see you, Stephen. And to have you back. I think you're in Ireland today, uh, along with Melissa, but I think you guys are yeah. in different parts of the country, right? Absolutely. We are. I, yeah, I'm in the real and we're capital. Not right. We're not. We're, oh, he's in the real capital. <laughs> <laughs> What's the real capital? Where's the real capital? So it's south, south of Ireland, Christopher. It's County Cork. It's the second biggest okay. city, right? And it's um, Cork. Bit of okay. bit of banter between Cork and Dublin people. Always. Or, you know. Always. The real, the real place. capital. Yeah. Cork. <laughs> Gabe, oh, I think we might need place. to bring some team coaching skills to the, uh, <laughs> this conversation to keep the Irish in line, right? I didn't wear my Cork <laughs> shirt, but there is the the, the map of, of Ireland with Cork and then not Cork. Oh. Um, so <laughs> I, I see that, that right? yeah. yeah, I see that in the, the, the shops in Cork when I was there last. Well, good fun. And I hope we can kind of keep this, uh, this spirit of fun and learning on today's show. But um, great to have you guys on. Um, I know you guys both work independently, but you also work together on some team coaching engagements. And we thought you would be a great dynamic duo to bring on the show. Um, as a way of getting started, uh, instead of reading off, you know, long LinkedIn profiles and all that, which I'll put up in case people want to go and check you guys out on LinkedIn. Uh, what I'm going to ask is that uh, you actually introduce each other. You've been working together a bit. And so maybe I'll start with you, Gabe. Do you want to introduce Stephen, and then I'll ask Stephen uh, to return the. Oh, I love this. Uh, yeah. So my favorite part of the day sometimes when when Stephen introduces me, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I get to return the favor this time. So uh, uh, what what do, what do we need to know about Stephen? So uh, first of all, he's a father of two uh, young kids, uh, Sunny and Layla, and um, also a husband uh, and. Uh, supportive husband and father, and that's what uh, resonates and really connects me to uh, to, uh, to each other. Our values are the same around family, um, and you know something about Stephen is that um, he's he's an athlete at the highest level, performed at an athlete at the highest level, and and really uh, taken what he has learned uh, throughout his amateur and then professional uh, uh, experience as an athlete as a as a hurler. Um, so I got a chance to, yeah. to learn about hurling when I was in Ireland. Um, but to know that he took his experience and his leadership into the professional world, and that's how he connects um, the, his experience to the business uh, aspirations uh, of his clients. Um, and then also just, uh, uh, you know, the way he approaches uh, his work is really um, looking at personal leadership and team leadership together. Um, and I really appreciate that uh, because I've mostly focused on organizational and team leadership. So anytime we get together, I'm always learning a lot about um, seeing, uh, you know, how uh, leadership shows up in different ways, uh, not just in team leadership, but also personal leadership. Nice. Awesome. Fabulous. Thanks, Gabe. Yeah. So, yeah, again, you mentioned earlier that we were connected and we have a huge connection with family and um being, being good fathers and good partners and obviously gave his two beautiful daughters as well and gave off all of his references himself as a dance dad right so that's something that um he can he can be very proud of taking his daughters to regular dance dance classes and dance competitions so but myself and gave very connected with our with our family values and um i suppose our you know our compassion and i think that naturally kind of brought us together in our with our shared purpose of through working with leaders and through working with teams you know 
making the world of work a better place and more rewarding for people. And, you know, we, we kind of connected initially through that and eventually, you know, luckily enough, began began to work together. And um, Gabe does, you know, significant work in, in, in that space. And, you know, most recently, I suppose we've been both been sharing a common passion of team of teams and luckily enough for, you know, sharing the passion of team of teams, but doing that work as well. And that's, that's what we do very well mm-hmm. together. Um, Gabe has been exceptional and, Good fun to work with as well, which is which is the main thing. You have to have, you know, a bit of fun, and um, you know, we work very well together. And you know, Gabe is exceptionally good at good at what he does. So, I'm yeah, very lucky. So, the two things there that you guys uh, mentioned that I have to follow up on and connect to the topic of teams and team coaching. So, the first one is for those who don't know, we have a TV show in the United States called Dance Moms, <laughs> which uh, my daughter um, likes to watch, and I find it horrifying. It's like these moms who like have their daughters in dance, and uh, they're very dramatic. Um, Mm -hmm. some boys too Mm -hmm. so anyways there's kind of a joke there about these dramatic dance moms but gay being a dance dad i think that's how you met your wife right gabe was uh, through. i I met my wife through uh yeah through social dancing and uh uh, just to take it to another level so um yeah i will be performing with my daughters so there's a there's a recital coming up and there's a dad and daughter uh portion of it so i'll be learning um one routine with each of them and then performing with them at the recital in June. So yeah, let's, let's, oh, that's let's amazing. keep going. Let's will go all be, the way. Recorded. Will that be, rec- yeah. will that be recorded? Uh, yes, it will. If it isn't, then we'll make sure that it gets captured for sure. Yeah. Happy. Sounds proud excellent. to share. We'll be proud to share that. Excellent. But I'm curious, Gabe, I'm sure there's a lot of connections between dancing and working with teams. Any uh, immediate connections you can make? It's a good metaphor, I think, for... Mm obviously the dance with teams or that dynamism, right? Of uh, leading and following. And yeah, like, leading yeah. and following, I, I would say connection and intention. Um, and also um, the, the concept of leadership and followership. Mm. Um, I, I think we talk a lot about leadership, but actually followership is also a very powerful leadership skill. Mm. Um, and we don't talk enough about it, to be honest. Um, so yeah, that's what comes to mind, like intention and, and, um, and communication. Love that. Love that. So I often observe that people aren't so keen on this whole idea of followership or even the word mm-hmm. followership seems mm-hmm. to um, not resonate very well mm-hmm. um, with folks. Do you have any, either of you, any insights around that or what are you exploring in the whole area of, you know, good followership? Because it is, it's just as an important part, right? Stephen, <laughs> good, good, good affection, Gabe. Yeah, it's a great question, Melissa. But you know, <laughs> and uh, as as leaders, you know, you have to be able to be led. You know, essentially, and that's what great leaders are. They they're not leaders that have all the answers. They realize that it's it's about you know the collective of the, the team is is where the best optimal answers and decisions and solutions lie. So to be able to be to be a strong leader also means to be a strong follower. So it's, um, I think the best leaders understand that. And it's clear and evident, mm-hmm. I suppose, but kind of at a high level. I, I think of it, um, so there's this kind of, oh, sorry, uh, we'll see you didn't jump in there. You know. No, no, go ahead. Go uh, ahead. I, uh, so I think of uh, the, the power of influence and one of the influence techniques we use, which is a form of leadership, is social proof which is kind of like do as I do. And so if I'm able to subordinate myself, that's something. But if you're hierarchically leading someone, but you actually put yourself in a position to actually be an equal team member in a different context, that's a very powerful way to to model a behavior for organization. Um, And so uh, especially because we deal in hierarchies, that's just the way that we're organized. So showing that you can actually take yourself out of that powerful position um, and, you know, be humble, uh, take feedback um, and not, uh, not being, not, not just walk around with your positional authority and walk around with this halo effect, just because you're have this positional authority doesn't mean you're good at everything. And so actually seeing people model that they're not good at something or shouldn't, shouldn't be in the lead of something is really just a super way to, for the rest of the organization to know that they're, they're, they're equal in, in many ways. So that's, that's where I see it showing up and, and demonstrating and, and modeling the behavior. Cool. 
Yeah, what I, what I've observed is um, followership for me is a bigger test of my value system mm -hmm. than than leadership, right? And you mm -hmm. know, just being open, me in a followership role often um, shows up. You know that mm. that the, the side of me that I don't want to to, to be showing up in mm. in organizational life, if, if if that makes sense. Like it's mm -hmm. it's you know it it's almost like you have a set of values that you uh, espouse that you you live by, but it gets tested out more for me in followership mm. than it does mm. does in leadership. Um, I don't know if that resonates with anybody, but. That's kind of how I experience it. Well, I mean, it, I think it clearly does. It, 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 again, because we work in organizations that have titles and so forth and hierarchies, we often by default defer until someone disrupts our thinking. And it's usually the leader says, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to sit back and I want to hear what you have to say. Like that's, that's a form of followership. It's like I, I'm interested in what you have to say. I'm interested in what, where your expertise in this, even if you don't have any. Um, and that's how we get the system to open up. You know, get yeah. people to be more forthcoming with each other, uh, be able to take chances, and so it it starts where there where there's positional authority. That person has to take a first step. One example of that that uh, just comes to my mind in a team coaching engagement I was a part of was where the leader used to chair all the the meeting. She was an IT leader, the CIO, chief information officer, and then over time during the engagement, she started to shift to letting two other team members co-host or co-chair the meetings. And it was striking to see how she then could take on a coaching role. And so she would, you know, they would run the meetings and then she would chime in and, you know, coach, really coach. Whereas I think when she was chairing the meeting, she couldn't coach because yeah. she was yeah. more directing. And I think that was a nice, just little small shift um, mm. that I think was really powerful. Uh, love this conversation about leadership and followership, but I want to get um, Stephen in around hurling. Um for those who don't know what hurling is, uh, Stephen, maybe you could give an introduction there, but any connections, you know, having yeah. been a professional athlete, being on sports teams that you've been able to bring over into the, the business world and in the team coaching space and, and in organizations. Yeah. So there's a, there, there's a lot, yeah, I suppose, crossover with, with, with sport and playing at the highest level in sport and being involved in teams as there is to the business. I suppose teams being obviously... Um, we're all involved in many teams. But Gabe, I want to bring you in just to, to explain hurling because I showed you hurling and brought you up to the to the local pitch. And, you know, Gabe, to be fair, I, he was better than what I thought he would be in terms of being able to, to strike the ball. But I'd love to, yeah. for you to be able to relay it back. Yeah, sure. Um, so hurling is played on a pitch that's twice the length of a soccer field. Is that a true statement? Because it seemed like it went on forever. Um. <laughs> There are two, um, I believe there's how many, I don't, are there seven people on a team that's on the field at one time, Stephen, or is it? 15. 15. 15, okay. so 15 each. All right. 15 each. 15, so talk, 15 talk each. To you all together, yeah. yeah. Um, and I have here a slitter, which is the ball that they use. Yeah. Uh, and for us, the United States, we would recognize <laughs> it, um, the goal as it looks like an upright with a, t with a crossbar. Uh, and you can score by either setting this thing above or below the cost crossbar between the uprights. And then, um, Stephen, you probably have a Hurley around you somewhere where no. you actually have the, the implement uh, upon which spot. it looks like, a, it looks like a, a field hockey stick. Uh, and then there are rules in which you can advance this ball and, and pass it um, to your colleagues. And I think one of the amazing things that I see you guys do is you guys actually catch it like across yeah. the field and then bounce it on your, on your Hurley. Um, so it's actually one of a couple things that amaze me. One, soccer. I played soccer, and that is a big field. And to know you're playing in a field that's twice as long as that mm. is already making me really, really tired. <laughs> um, and then the amount of coordination it takes to just individually coordinate the movement of this thing is amazing. And then also knowing that there's 50 people on the field, uh, <laughs> I can imagine there's an amazing degree of, 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 of training and strategizing that goes into being a successful uh hurling team good stuff gabe so so yeah so it's so at a high level hurling it's a irish it's an indigenous irish sport and it's um 
amateur in its status, right? But it, a lot has shifted in that over the last um, couple of decades, really. And it's still amateur, but it nearly shouldn't be. It's the richest amateur sport in the world. Generate 300 million <laughs> a year, right, for the Irish government. And the players don't get paid. So there's a, there's a lot there. But it's um, just to highlight the significance of the sport in Ireland. And we play, you know, in the stadiums around Ireland and Croke Park being the biggest one. So 83,000 people is the capacity of the stadium. So wow. I would have represented Cork. As I said, the real capital of Ireland in Croke Park in front of that, those crowds in championship finals for, um, for you know, I, was, I was remember that team for 11 years and I was lucky enough to captain, captain the team as well. So really powerful um, experience for me. But I played hurling and sports since I was since I was very, very young at, at the highest level and learned a lot about um, teams and you know, cohesion and, and culture and leadership throughout that journey. And I've been involved in teams where there was exceptional individuals, but collectively we were weak and we, we didn't fulfill our potential and where we were underdogs in many in many ways because we didn't have the exceptional individuals, but we won championships because we were a great team. And I've mm. been, you know, I've, I've had great managers, I've had great captains and stepped into the captainship role myself. So I've learned a hell of a lot that enables me to, you know, bring that experience across to, to the work, the work I do with teams as well in, in businesses. Can you add, uh, so Steve, uh, just one thing, uh, just talking to you about your hurling career is that in your role as a team member and as a leader, it's not just what you're doing on the field. It's actually your interactions with mm-hmm. management and the organizations that are around it. That's actually mm-hmm. a bigger thing that people don't actually acknowledge or understand, um, yeah. especially mm-hmm. for something as big in Ireland. Yeah, so so like you mentioned earlier, I think Gabriel on dance, and you said intention and communication were two huge parts of it, and connection as well was one. But like in you know, there's 15 players step out on onto the playing field, but the readiness and preparedness and performance of those 15 players is down to the the team of 50 people that are or 40 to 50 people that are actually involved in the overall setup in the overall team, and it's the it's it's that's the that's where you need to get things right. It's the cohesion and connect, connection between the backroom team, the management, the players, you know, people that aren't playing that are on a bench, the subs, and all of that. And it, and it, it you know there's um there's a lot can go wrong there ultimately, and there's a lot that needs to be you need to be really intentional about building the connection and the strength and connection and um you know the intention between all of those parts. And once you get alignment there, you know it becomes a hell of a lot easier because the, the 15 players that go out on the pitch they need to have a platform for success. And if they don't have that platform for success, their potential will be left on the table, you know? Mm. So it's so it's complex, you know, but simple as well. You know, I don't like the... But there's, a, there's, a, there's another layer, I think, also around the, the ecosystem and the importance of the GAA and its impact on community from yeah. as you say you started at a very young age learning hurling yeah. mm-hmm. you would have spent time uh you know in summer camps and all of that that's a big huge part of the national ecosystem and the the county ecosystem and then i know we're teasing each other because that's what um you know dubs tease everybody yeah. that's not from dublin but you know I guess there's the also the piece around um, identity, right? And yeah. if you travel through any county, you see the identity colours of that county, the pride in that county, and then the pride again then at, at a national level. So it, mm. it's, it kind of yeah, moves from point, something it? small into something quite yeah. big, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and Gabe, you would have got yeah. that, right? So Gabe, interest, interestingly enough, when he was over in Ireland, when we were working together, you know, with the team you were working with, there was a lot of, you know, back and forth about Limerick were going to win the All Ireland and vice versa. And I suppose we were in Cork at the time. So, so again, and all playful, all play, all playful okay. teasing for, for sure. Um, yeah. The um, the thing you just uh, you mentioned that really sparked something inside of me, uh, Melissa, around identity, yeah. uh, which is something that um, e- even Steve and I had kind of a, an amazing experience with. Uh, some of our engagements around acknowledging identities in 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 a, in a work system, and then then allowing us to reconnect or recombine or acknowledge that we're a, a, a greater identity. Um, it's only been like it's been at the forefront of my work in the last two or three years, which is noticing that 
we take, at least in, in the organization I'm in, we're taking individuals or group or, or teams or departments and kind of smashing them together and then moving them over here and then moving them over here and then ha- having them do some work without actually acknowledging maybe where they come from or what their values are or what this, what this culture is now and what's needed of them. And so I'm noticing that what's calling what's the, the work that's coming now is helping us name what's, what's going on. Like, Hey, we're this group and this is what, this is what happened to us. And here are the things that we value and here's the things that motivate us. And by way, we're this group. And then just by having those individuals, teams and groups reveal themselves, then you can sort of create this other identity that's more useful as opposed to opposing. Mm. You can use the word silos, but um, mm. I, I, I don't know. I, 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 it's just the work we did uh, with Steven that kind of revealed itself. But I think um, noticing that there's oftentimes uh, even lack of understanding that that identity is also bringing pride yeah. to yeah. to a group of people, whether or not you do the work or not, you can still cheer for somebody can cheer for a team because you're connected with them but if there's nothing that exists around there it makes it harder to feel that that value and connection yeah i think that's a really nice connection to um you know a lot of times when we work with teams and organizations there's a big focus on composition and who's on the team right so who matters a lot but i think you're kind of bringing it to another level around how do we actually unlock the who of people's sense of meaning and purpose, which stems from their identity. I know we do a lot of work um, around narrative and helping people really share stories to unlock elements of who they are. I don't know if you guys have different ways of actually doing that with teams, but I think there's a powerful connection there to individual identity, to purpose, individual purpose, and then with team purpose. And over and over again, I think we find that when individuals and teams are really grounded and rooted in their purpose or purposes, that becomes incredible motivational energy. And when you're lacking that, it's just kind of hard to get lift off the ground. Yeah. If you guys have anything yeah, to follow no, up on around that. Yeah. I think it's an interesting identity is a very interesting uh, concept. Obviously when you've got an individual, um, for giving an example of some leaders that, you know, that I, that I work with or would have worked with maybe have, um, been involved in an organization where they would have witnessed, uh, you know, very demanding and forceful leadership behaviors being rewarded in the organization. So attach their identity to that and that's what they need to be. And as a result of that would have, you know, always sought out to, to behave aligned to that identity. But in reality, it's not true to their authentic selves, right? So so then there's a separation between who they are and, and how they lead. And obviously that's not the best place to lead from. So there's always that identity to play with in individuals and again there's it's, it's more it's more than that and and at the team level i think yeah i think i think for sure i suppose look there could be um an identity develop over time that could be something that you could be proud of but could be an elephant in the room as well that is holding mm-hmm. you back and you know it, it could be a team that you know again full of talented individuals but never come together or a team of uh, people that don't believe in themselves and that's not the team you give the work to that needs to get done and and and, and you know through through doing that assessment phase uh Christo is, is where you kind of you, you figure that out but i think it's it's important in that context where it's damaging and it's it's an identity that is attached to the team and and within themselves they're trying to avoid it but they don't be intentional about putting it out there and discussing why it is the way it is and and that's the current state but what's the desired state and this bridge that gap. So I think that that's something very, um, very important. Yeah. I want to toggle over, you know, guys, you guys highlighted the idea of multi-stakeholder environments, you know, the hurling context, but a team of teams, which I think is something that you guys have been working on and, you know, was part of the reason why we wanted to invite you on. But I was just thinking of a case that I was working on, Ruth Wagaman and I were working on a case around supporting a workday implementation that was seriously delayed. And uh, we were asked to come in and try to help with the team effectiveness halfway through that implementation. And what we were struck by was that there were nine developer teams, there was a management team and a governance team. And the problem wasn't in the teams themselves, but it was really the interconnection between all the teams working in concert 
But as we got the, each team was led by co-leaders, like an IT leader and a functional leader. And when we got them all in the room, what we discovered was they weren't really bought into the whole purpose of the initiative uh, in the first place. And so even nine, you know, uh, eight, you know, 18 months into a major transformation, shifting from SAP to Workday, the big missing ingredient was really buy-in and that the leaders themselves were having a hard time selling the vision of the whole thing and they weren't bought in. So that's where we started. Mm -hmm. We actually needed to start doing purpose work with all mm -hmm. of them to build a shared purpose for a multi-year, you know, project. And I think that to me was really interesting and talk about like a disconnect between mm -hmm. organization priorities, the teams, and then sense of lack of sense of purpose and identity. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, building on that, um, would love to get into some of the work you guys are doing. I know you probably need to keep it confidential and whatever you're willing to share. Um, but let's talk a little bit about team of teams. What is team of teams? And, um, you know, maybe you guys can do a little storytelling about, you know, some of the work you're doing in the team of team space. Uh, sure. I'll start. And then, um, so, uh, I, when I think of, um, I think what's interesting is that, um, our colleague Ruth wrote a paper 10, 12 years ago, right? I was like the future of teams and what, what to, what teams might be in the future. And I think that the, 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 the provocative statement she made is that is that is the notion of a bounded, stable group of people to a, to a, you know, a shared purpose. Is that going to be true for the, for the teams of the future? And I think the answer is, is that's a part of it, but I think more and more so we're seeing work being done by the collective organization um, um, in service to the, in service to its purpose or stakeholder. Um, so, I just want to make some distinctions. Sometimes we use the team, like a, we use the term team and name only, which is, I don't mean to be like judgmental derogative, but it just means a, a group of folks that don't necessarily know what they are, why they should be working together, right? Or they might not even necessarily need to work together, but are stuck together in a, in a room every month or every week for some reason to share information that no one else cares about. Um, I'm sorry to cut across you, unidentified yeah. as a team, right? Yes, identified yeah. as a team. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that we we do, we, we look at is that usually we get a, um, a management group or an operating committee, like they're essentially the leads of the of the functional areas, which, uh, which oftentimes they're then optimized to just be the best darn functional area they could be irrespective of if they're at cross purposes or at odds with their other departments. Um, and so one of the things that we do is we try and lift them up and try and reveal the connections between them um, and then connect, uh, connect their, uh, the, the, the need for them to work together to achieve their organizational purpose. Um, and if you're describing the, if, if they're calling uh, Krista, if they're calling Ruth and, 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 uh, and Krista in to implement, uh, to help support this, uh, this work day implementation. That's like really, that means it's going really, really badly. It's like, and so that's one of the things we look yeah, for. People is are sort getting of, fired when we were. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What we're looking for is pain in the system, pain that's really expressed by dissatisfied stakeholders or, or, or frustrated people in, 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 the, um, in, in the group or some other overlying purpose that's not, not being accomplished. But either way, some, some friction or dissatisfaction is in there. And so one of the first things we do is we help discover what that is. And it could be because they're not connected to the organizational purpose or because they need to discover another reason for them to come together. Um, What's your so, discovery yeah. process? Just so that we can help our listeners really get a feel. What's your discovery yeah. process? Do you have uh, one that you use and customize each time? What's, so, what's um, your approach there? I'm going to ask Stephen to share one of the activities we do, which we learned and then did together, and then he did by himself. And, and oh, yeah. for the for the ORSC practitioners out there, um, this activity we did, which is a part of discovering who we are and then how we're connected. Okay, so this is part of the launch. You know, when we brought these leaders of different teams together, and we first of all, I suppose, needed to get them into position where they were operating from from their authentic selves and kind of remove the barriers, you know, to, to who they were and showing up for each other. So we've done an exercise, I think, Krista, you mentioned earlier on Story of Self, where 
they just shared their journeys from an authentic place. And we've done a lot of work with the leader to, to get her to role model um, from a strong, courageous and authentic place and vulnerability. And and that with that done and that exercise done and the connection there and kind of they're, they're ready to speak from, from a place of authenticity, then we've done a really powerful exercise where we then looked at it from the team level. So we brought the individual level and the leader level, but then they were in a position where they can represent the team of teams from that authentic and courageous place. And, and that was the, the exercise that we done. It's called land's work. And um, probably familiar with it. And mm-hmm. it was really powerful. And, and it was just, you know, naturally there was, I suppose, three different kind of, I suppose, teams that emerged within there. So there was a lot of different, there was, I suppose, 12 different functions and different, um, I suppose, teams represented, but there was three kind of uh, groupings of, of more cohesion within the team. So it was kind of like, you know, they, they merged together and, and from that place then we got them to um share their experiences in a fun in a fun way about what it was like living in their world. And um Land's work was the was the metaphor we used and it just generated a shared empathy, a shared understanding, a shared connection, um, gave them a space to speak vulnerably um, you know, about something that would have been maybe more had more tension if if we we didn't do the exercise. And Gabe, I might flick it over to you about the exercise Land's work if I want to describe it for what it is. Like just I a little bit more detail on what it is. I just think you did. Yeah, I think you did a beautiful job. It, it's essentially just taking a group to uh, uh, through the metaphor of, of, of traveling um, and traveling different lands, and each group represents its own, has its own atmosphere, its environment, its values, um, and uh, things that are hard about it. And then we actually were able to reveal those, share those things amongst those three groups. Um, again, to realize hey, maybe we do have sort of the same pains. We also have the same aspirations. We share a lot of the same values and we also share some of the same stakeholders and we have different relationships with those stakeholders. So just through that conversation of opening it up and, and being vulnerable about, hey, this is, this is what's hard about being here, but this is also what we value and what we're proud of. You're starting to see them recognize how more alike they are than they are different. Uh, and then from that activity, then we're able to then jump into some purpose work is we've identified some shared values. We've, we have an idea of our shared stakeholders. Um, now let's, now let's really get to the heart of why we actually need to work together and acknowledge there are some siloed work. That's important. There's stuff that we do that we don't need to know about. What we do is figure out the stuff we have to work on. And so like the shorthand we use is, uh, and, uh, we borrowed this from, you know, our, our mentor, uh, Peter Hawkins, like what, what is it that uh, what is it uh, that the world needs that only we can do, right? Only we in this room can do that. No one else will do um, that we can do. Fabulous, and I, I love that moment where you help uh, a team who maybe arrive into uh, you know a team coaching session, thinking that they're a million miles apart from each other and elicit some kind of exercise where the team members actually see, you know, we're a lot closer together on certain things uh, than, than we were, were apart. And just actually helping them see that together in real time can create such a momentous energy shift for a team. And then you're really getting into the nitty gritty of conversations then yeah. as, as to, well, how, how are we gonna make that work and come alive? So I could have cross you there, Gabe. Continue. I'll press play again. <laughs> pick the story up there again, and take us on to the next the next piece. Uh, I, I mean, I I, uh, I think we got to, to where we need to go as far as laying the groundwork for the purpose work, which is mm-hmm. once you and um one of the ahas I think, Krista had kind of was saying it over and over again, uh, many times we talked before is allowing a team or group of people to acknowledge that it has individual work and that's okay. And in fact, acknowledging it has individual work and it doesn't need to collaborate on it. It's actually a very relieving thing. It reduces a lot of anxiety in a group to know we have work that we don't need to talk to each other about. But then it gives you focus because maybe it's only one or two things that we actually have to be interdependent on that we can uh, focus on. So that's what allowed us. So doing all that work or revealing the system to itself allowed us to actually then do the work for purpose work. Can you guys back up a little bit and provide some context for the engagement? Like, were you guys brought in because there was like an organization transformation going on? And 
I'm curious, did you start with one team um, and are you working with multiple teams? Can you talk a little bit about the arc of the engagement? If there's one yeah, that's coming yeah, to yeah. mind, uh, yeah, maybe I, multiple ones, but for yeah. Sure. So so just in the, with this, this is a um, pharma company, uh, multinational, of course, uh, one of the big one of the big ones. And I suppose they, I, I would, would have been working with them and I'm working with them for the last five, six years, Krista. And mm. I suppose just naturally I've, I've you know, made my way to, to the, you know, the plant leadership team and um, also just kind of their organization is split in kind of two different plants, small molecule, large molecule. So we've um, I've I've worked across both, and uh, and I've I've I was brought in to initially to um, work in the sm- so it's two so it's interesting, Chris, right? It was two different type, um, I suppose engagements that that they wanted me to support them with. First one was a turnaround project where the organization was performing poor, and it needed to change, and they identified the I suppose the level below the plant team, so the operations, the flow team. 25 people in there as key to that and then on the other side of the business they were performing exceptionally well but they wanted to do it in a more human way so you know you're brought in to make the excellence that they have sustainable and you're brought in to to turn it around to you know make the organization a high performing organization again in a sustainable way so they both came kind of to to my 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 business i suppose roughly kind of probably three four months between them and uh, we, we kicked one off. I brought Gabe and we kicked one off and then we brought the other one up slowly behind and a lot of similarities with, with what we've done with the engagements. And um, that was the context, uh, Christo, I suppose, if, if, if I can give more detail than that, I can, but it just pause. Is there any kind of questions, Gabe, do you want to add to that? No, I, I, th- I think you're naming the motivation, which is, yeah. um, uh, let's talk about the shift that's that was needed in one group versus the other, right? So there was one group who was working extremely hard uh, being pushed very, very hard. Um, and along the way, I, I use the term like accumulating social debt uh, yeah, within yeah, within yeah. the team itself and then across the organization. That's not sustainable, right? Um, so that was the, that was like the pain that was the motivation that brought us in. So how can we how can we bring more humanness to that that piece of work? And then I think for both sides, I think what's interesting for us is when we work with a team of teams or leadership team, we're I'm going to use the word transformation. It's overused a lot, but essentially, how are they going to how are they going to reimagine how who they want to be in the future? Right, that something needs to change, and what role are they going to play in it? So we're discovering their role in that transformation. Right, they're the ones that are going to be doing it through their actions. Um, and so one of the things that that I've kind of bring to our work is okay, um, we can we can coach, we can watch you, we can observe you, we can give you. You know, we can observe your your interactions, um, but one of the things that we like to do is coach them through a piece of work, not just because you're working. We see you working. You work. You come in every day. You're doing something, but let's coach you through a piece of work. So let's actually discover what it is, give it a goal, hmm. and then decompose it into recognizable actions, and then create visualization systems and cadences and agreements on how to skillfully and, 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 and in a fun way, in a respectful way, accomplish this together. Um, and so that's, that's, we're always looking for the actual work. And I think that's what makes mm. um, our engagements more sustainable, I think, in that we're actually tracking something. We're not just looking at you and going, hey, you're doing great, mm. or you're not doing great, or you're, or you're happy, you're not happy. We're actually tracking a piece of work. Mm. Yeah. So it sounds like you started, I mean, Stephen, you built a number of relationships and built a reputation there over years. And then two parts of the system engaged you with a three-month gap. Um, Were those two then brought together or you're still working with them kind of independently, even though they're part of the same house? So so they operate as nearly separate businesses, but in the same you know, okay. world, right? So it's you know, sort of kind of, it's a, it's a, it's you know, they're different. Um, they make different gotcha. medicines, right? And it's just, yeah, you know, there there is similarities, but there's there's there diff- there's I suppose the buildings are different and the approaches are different and the value right, streams right. and all that. Okay. So it's so it's different, but, but um, yeah, well, yeah. But what makes these team of team cases versus just a one-off team type thing? I guess are you dealing with multiple teams and then management teams that are leading different teams? I'm curious about that part. Well, within the actual 
I suppose when you think of it, so if you think of it like um, at the epicenter are the operations, the production, production managers, operation directors, they're at the center, but then surrounding them is the support functions supporting. So the medicine has been made and the operations goes on the ground. That's where the medicine is made. And then surrounding that is the support functions. So that's quality, science, engineering. Surrounding that again is a secondary support function. Kind of the outer ring again would be HR and finance and they're all the different teams that are interdependent, right. all in service of top quality medicine being brought to a patient. Right. And um, you need to, so that's that's where the team of teams comes in. And then every team throughout the organization, as you go down, you're going to have a representation of each one of those, right? Yeah. And at the top level, you got the managers and middle managers, and then you got the people, the, the technicians and tech, technical experts. So, no, it sounds like you're working yeah. across the whole value chain, and you've been able to get access to all those teams or the leaders of those teams. Is that fair? Yeah. 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 For I, sure. I, and look, you're going game. Sorry. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a sign. Like once you actually start to realize you're, you're seeing something that either your stakeholder customer recognizes as complete, you realize it's not just done by one of these folks. Mm. It's done by them together. So we're, we're actually just making those connections explicit. Yeah. Right. So I, I think I heard when you were, doing the kind of discovery launch phase, you were bringing the leaders of the teams together. Are they then going back and disseminating that into their own teams? Or are you, as part of the work that you're going to do, bringing those intact teams together to do kind of like launches, visualize the work, all of that stuff? Oh, I think what's coming forward, Stephen, it's only because it's an actual thing in the forefront of your you and you and my uh, mind. We can talk about our our engagement that we're working on right now, right? For next yeah, week, yeah, for sure, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And we can actually, it's they're a charity organization, so there's no. I mean, that's um. Can we shift to like an, yeah. another a, 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 like actual another example? Yeah, yeah, another yeah. example. Yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please do, yeah, yeah. Because we're doing exactly what you're describing, Melissa, right now in in this in this case. In this new case, okay, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to give us like a bit, a bit of bit background of context? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. 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 So, so just before we go there, right? So, just with the with the farm organization, the, the so what we've done with them, right? And I'll, I'll pivot across is that they've identified what success looks like and what they want to achieve as an organization, and um, they've identified how they want to work together and how they want their teams to work together, and uh, we work with the leadership team and how they can do that, but we don't work directly with each of their teams individually or so. Okay, perfect, so, yeah. So they're operating as yep. team coaches and team leaders and doing that. So yep. it's kind and of- And they will um, bring it all back and um, perfect. Yeah, and then, yeah. so 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 that's kind of, yeah, we can we can sort of back to that, but with, where we are right now with, with this organization that I'm working with, they're a charity in the UK. They're um, absolutely exceptional at what they do. They have 500 staff, so not very big, but not very small either. And, mm-hmm. you know, I've been working with the leadership team for, for two years now. And where we are right now is we've- They've identified the, the best leaders just at the level below and they've brought them all together for, um, I suppose, a, a leadership program. But what they're doing is they're taking the strategy that the guys are working. So the, so the executive team have been executing their strategy exceptionally well and they want a succession plan so the level below can do that. So if these people, so if the executive team stepped away, nothing would change in the organization. So what they're doing is we're, we're, we're taking some components of that strategy, bringing it down and that's going to form part of the leadership program. They're going to have, they're going to work together as cross-functional collaborative teams in three different project teams. There's 17 in the program. And um, I suppose myself and Gabe are going to work on that as well to bring that, um, to bring that to, to their operation, how they do things and with that um, collaborative approach. Is that fair enough, Gabe? Am I yeah. Speaking yeah. That? And, and I think just like you're actually then inviting more parts of the to system to the work. Right. Oh, yeah. They're actually yeah. they're gonna be practicing the things that you had coached the leadership team on for the last years and we're gonna put them in play. Actually, we're gonna make the senior leaders now the coaches yep. for these teams. So there's so there's yeah. three teams, right? Gonna be merged. So as part of a leadership program and a um, an effectiveness program, you know, having a wordy pursuit is where you a practical project where you can actually put what you learn into practice is very important. And they've they've done that by taking some of their strategy and putting mm-hmm. the importance of that responsibility down into the into the level below, but they haven't stepped away in that they're going to now be, um, you know, a coach. So each one of the leaders are going to step in as a coach to, to the different teams. And um, that's, uh, I suppose, myself and Gabe will, will coach them 
in terms of how they can coach the team. So always, always coaching the leaders in terms of how they can lead their teams rather than, yeah. I suppose, doing that yeah. for them. That's yeah. the sustainability piece that you're talking about. Like, how does this continue after mm. yeah. the both of you have, have finished your work? Yeah. And they've I guess experienced it, was... it as well. Melissa's last thing is they, they, they've experienced it and experienced the benefit and transformation of it through our, through our work. So by going through that process first and by then working with um, other leaders throughout the organization with their support is important because they've been through the process. They've mm. the role modeled it. Mm. I guess not to put either of you on the spot, but one team that we haven't spoken about that's in this ecosystem of team of teams is a pair of team coaches. So I'm an absolute biggest believer of when going into a coaching engagement, you need to work as a pair of team coaches. I think earlier in the conversation, we were talking about the dance between the coach and and the team or the dance between the coach and the system. But there is something around the dance between the pair of, of, of team coaches so I'd love to know a little bit more around how you're bringing intentionality to your pairing, what you're learning, uh, sure. if you're willing to share what mistakes you've run into and how you've remedied those. Anything, because I, I think that is really interesting yeah. uh, to, to understand that re- the importance of that relationship and how it shows up in the room. I'd love to just start with a, a, a story and then you can finish the story because you actually finished the story, Stephen. So, um, I have no uh, idea what Steve, Gabe is going to say here, guys, just by the way. Uh, so uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I just, uh, the way that Steve and I work is we're, we're very transparent. Um, we visualize all the work. We have a mural board that has all of our engagements. We, we brainstorm in real time and then we brainstorm asynchronously. We send each other screenshots and voicemail or voice notes to each other, different points of time. Um, and so, uh, you, you know, the communications there. I think some of the things that we do um, that I do sort of as a behavior implicitly is usually before we start the day of the engagement, we're checking, with you, hey, how do you want me to show up for this activity here? How, how do you want me to call you in here? And so we're actually being explicit about our needs and expectations in real time. And you know, that's a designed alliance in real time, you know, for folks who are old folks, but we're, we're actually try, trying to, to make sure that we're um, contracting even with each other throughout yeah. the course of our engagement and with everybody else. So I think that's just a behavior we have. Um, but as far as the way we, we work is oftentimes we're bringing new, uh, we're bringing new um, uh, exercises to each other. And oftentimes the other person's at the edge of their, uh, of their learning, their, their anxiety, and, and, yeah. and so yep. we usually yep. do model well at least for the first time we'll model something for each other um and then we'll talk through it afterwards and make sure someone's careful with it and so um in the situation um that we're in i we, i did the lands work with with steven together and we learned this from our colleague or we did it together uh Christer, on our sailing trip and then i learned it from my colleague uh abigail uh well um but I did it in real time with, with Steven and we, we talked about the notes on how to about facilitate this activity. We did together, uh, really got amazing uh, response and results together. And then um, we were gonna run it again for another, for another uh, team. And what had, what had happened was um, I wasn't able to come over to um, Ireland. Uh, another story around why I couldn't come over around that, but I wasn't able to do it. And so, so in many ways, I'm like, I have this feeling as a partner, like I really, you, you, we know we have a good reason to come over and I'm feeling like I'm letting you down. I'm like, okay, what can I do to help you prepare? Let's go over the notes again. Let's go over this, let's go over that. And so Steven, can you talk more about what that felt like for you as someone who had to do yeah. it alone, but all the work that we did yeah. together? Well, yeah, for sure. So. No, we done the assessment phase and we, we were showing up very well and you know we were taking it one step at a time there was huge excitement for the launch and uh, you know myself and gabe have already were already active in the organization and had a good approach together and kind of a good reputation of Stephen and gabe work well together right in the dyna- dynamism and their ability to, to get the best for the engagement so so the team leader essentially ultimately was really excited about me and gabe together um and this, this team was under a lot of pressure and there was a lot of fear, it was low psychological safety, um, a lot of anxiety. 
So, you know, the kind of narrative was you only get one chance to do this with this team. It has to go right. <laughs> you know, that, and no that's pressure. Um, you know, what, what, what was that doing to your psychological safety? <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> but like, I, I was, it was, it was great. Myself and Gabe were going to, going to do a great job. And all of a sudden, Gabe couldn't make it over. And it was only <laughs> a week and a half, literally, before the launch. So I am, um, I remember, look, first of all, myself and Gabe spoke about what was the best thing to do from our perspective, what were the options, what was the best thing to do and before I did anything else. And I got real clarity from that conversation was to do it without Gabe. So my next approach then was to go down to, to on site and then to have a conversation with the team leader about, about that. And um, that was a challenging conversation. But <laughs> I, one of the key things for the leader as well is, and this came through in the assessment phase, and I, I actually, you know, work one-to-one as well I've done, done a good bit of work one-to-one with that that leader and it was her um, very cynical approach and lack of trust in people you know so um, I had to sit with that and just kind of walk her through and talk her through that it needs to be done and um, you know it kind of by the end of the conversation reluctantly we were moving ahead with it and uh, mm-hmm. you said literally said I know look you, you got to trust you got to trust me on this 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 is what the team needs and the team needs you right now and um, it'll do, it'll go exceptionally well. So I left driving home, and I said to myself, <laughs> "Just no, <laughs> I got to do this." But I had confidence, like even though I was there, there was a, there was a sense of anxiety within me because the team was in a bad place and there was a lot going on. But I still had it. I still had it. There was still a sense of confidence that I knew I knew I could do a good job. And I suppose one element of that confidence was no one, even though Gay wasn't be there, wasn't going to be there. I'd have his full support and I'd be going in, you know, with, with our cohesion at play. And that, that that did give me, even though I was there alone, I didn't feel like I was alone. Mm. And I know it's easy to say yeah. that, but it actually yeah. actually really felt like that, you know. And he was available at any moment of time. I knew it. He was available. I never had needed to use it, but phone a friend was available as well at any moment of time. And we set ourselves up well, even on the day that we were still in support of each other. So, yeah. is that fair enough, Gabe? So, uh, to me, honestly, Stephen, the biggest compliment that you gave me was when you we debrief and talk about how great. So I was relieved as well because what we're, this actually we're talking about is not an easy thing to do. It's like really, really no, hard to up. hold the room for the number of people and the and the and the actual nature of that relationship in that room. That alone is the degree of difficulty, super, super high. So the fact that it was is it executed amazingly is just a credit to Steve. And we remember Scott. they reached out after Gabe as well. Remember? Yeah. Re- recently, we got to reach out to. One of the guys wanted to bring it to the to the global team. Yeah, so the I good work that we do, they they were great. Yeah. But the great the great uh, compliment I was happy to receive was it felt like you were with me, like because of all the work we did to prepare each other, mm-hmm. and I was supposed to be there. Um, I would prefer to be there. I I tell myself never coach alone. It's just too complex. There's too many things <laughs> going on. For one, yeah. per- I, I really can't sleep at night well. And, and actually, the funny thing, Stephen, you didn't sleep well that night. You told me you actually <laughs> went to bed at like three in the morning and woke up at five to, or four. To yeah, there was some element of preparation in that as well. There was, yeah. it was a busy week all around. There was other engagements I had. So, But that's sometimes that's the life of a team coach as well. You know, you got yeah. to yeah. show up well. And sometimes you got to, things don't go well in your week and you got to prepare and other things are fact. So. You know. It's interesting. There's like showing up alone, but there's um, also showing up alone with backup support, right? Which mm-hmm. is, I think, one of the reasons yeah. why supervision is really important or working with colleagues so that you can go in with uh, the right support behind you, right? Um, yeah. But I oftentimes find going in solo um, can stretch us as well. So I, I, I think it's probably better to go in, especially when you're in complex systems with partners and, and co-team coaches, but um, there can also be some benefits to being in there solo sometimes, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, you guys have captured a number of things like Land's work from Orsk. You spoke a little bit about you know public narrative around storytelling and doing purpose work. Uh, I think you've alluded to visual management is helping teams visualize their work. And you know, I think that gets into Kanban and Gabe, you're a, a Kanban trainer. Um, are there any other kind of things that really stand out in terms of, you know, I think team coaches like tools and approaches and things that really you kind of draw on when you're doing the team of teams mm-hmm. work. I mean, there's another element here, which is really about building relationships and trust with the leader and the, the leaders of various functions. But I'm curious, if there's any other kind of silver bullets or magic things that you think really stand out that help in these kind of complex 
engagements where you're moving a whole, trying to help support a whole value chain mm -hmm. being effective? Um, so I, I've been trying to simplify my world and, and cause drawing from so many things, it's amazing. You have so many tools, but also then you actually don't know what you do anymore because you're a jack <laughs> of all trades. So uh, I, I, I've been re-embracing my, my initial passion around like this socio socio technical systems theory, which essentially is it's, the idea is that there's two systems and you can look at the social system and the work system and simplifying it. Like when we take intervention, we, we invade a system. It's helpful for me to know if it's just a social system intervention or if it's just a work system intervention, but that the intention is to optimize both. So in what ways is, are we increasing, you know, belonging and unity uh, in a group that also touches the work, invites the work into that belonging and unity, right? Uh, and so that's, you know, and that's, uh, yeah, that's my new lens I'm trying out right now, but it's, it's easier than all, than just having a hundred different tools, hundred mm -hmm. ways of looking things. But mm -hmm. when, when we, it, whether it's, whether, whatever activity is, I'm asking myself, all right, what am I intervening in? Is this a social system intervention only? Is it a work system? And how can we make those two things the same and better together? I mean, in a, in a simple way, that's kind of like a, the classic um, task relationship side of work, right? Um, which, you know, there are some team effectiveness models that just kind of look at hmm. your high on task and high on relationship, and that makes you a better team. But I think in terms of managing the complexity of systems, that's kind of mm -hmm. interesting rubric to organize all the different tools that you're drawing from, from agile, from ORSC, systemic team coaching, six yeah. positions or whatever influences you're drawing from right yeah i just add a little bit to that christo i think yeah like you you're always you're always trying to make it a fun experience it's an experience you want people to remember how they felt in that experience just as mm. much as what they learned and learned from each other so you always have i'm all like for me my experience what really works well is just all all of it's weaving in space for um honest conversation and reflection so like something something like rose thorn bud you know triple h highlight hero hardship just giving people space to speak from themselves and i heard recently there was a research um, study done uh, i heard this about a year and a half ago that the best teams in the world spend you know when they're together and they're convening two thirds of the time it's on a task but one third of the time their conversations are on life who you mm -hmm. are as a person family all of these things so you're always trying to increase their awareness of each other and their support of each other and their compassion towards towards each other. Yeah. So they do these exercises and they do they do lift in their um in their mood and their and their connection to each other. And then also when you do the the exercises about task and the challenging exercises that require a difficult conversation, they would have better conversations as a result of doing stuff yeah. like that. So you always have to weave those conversations in at the right time. And um, also designing great experiences centered around just having fun getting people on their feet, team building mm. activities, but at the right time, in the right way. In service right of task work. In service yeah. and service of task work. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a whole, you know, bag of tricks I have where I get people doing activities, <laughs> having fun, being with each other, achieving something very simple in a fun way, a little bit of competition. And when you bring that into the day, it makes creates motivation, of, right? For, yeah, you're creating a space. Yeah. But what you're describing is like how people feel at work or feel about their yeah. work matters. And, if we just go right to task, a lot of times we kind of miss creating the environment and conditions. But you also talked about fun, yeah. which really stimulates yeah. learning and creativity, yeah. right? When we're having fun. So, yeah, I love that. You know, we need to create the environment or conditions that people can bring their best. And people yeah. just don't show up in a session ready to go. We have to kind of prime the pump, so to speak. Yeah, yeah I always reference it like um, rungs on a ladder. You know, so it's kind of like always when you think about any session you have, it's kind of like, okay, where are they? Where are they coming in? You got to just take them one, one rung on the ladder at a time, right? So some of those rungs in the ladders are those exercises, those short, yeah. snappy exercises that connect them or give them an opportunity to have some fun. Yeah. I don't know. It's amazing are... how, yeah, it's amazing how groups of people convince themselves to work in really unhygienic ways. Mm -hmm that are really frustrating the team. Nobody speaks about that. And sometimes mm. it requires, you know, a, an intervention such as ours to come in and, and, and kind of highlight these things. So it was a team that uh, Ruth and I were working with recently. And we seriously had to have a conversation 
uh, with with the chief of staff around allowing uh, like a bathroom break. And you're just kind of thinking, <laughs> how is this? Wow. You know, how is having yeah. every single second of the time you are together scheduled conducive mm. to, you know, them being their best thinkers together, them being able to provide creative mm. solutions to really tricky enterprise problems when, mm. you know, it's it's kind of like almost, yeah. I, I'm not even sure you'd get it in the military, would you? Like being <laughs> scheduled from 7 a.m. in the morning <laughs> until 10 and 11 yeah, p.m. Yeah. at night because we must yeah. get every single second out of you that we are are together um so i do think those hygiene factors are as Mm -hmm. equally as important as any of the the work that we do and and role modeling uh hygiene factors yeah you know i think that reminds me you know gabe alluded to we were we were doing some uh, before the pandemic some um kind of we were trying to innovate a little bit and working in dynamic environments so we went out on a dutch tall ship that was 200 foot long the wheel the swan and we were trying to kind of mod you know a lot of our learning environments tend to be very curated right they're in boardrooms they're in hotel rooms everything's mm-hmm. curated there's everything's in 75 there's 90 minute agenda. blocks we got a break we've got everyone's the agenda weeks in advance right <laughs> And we wanted to mirror reality, which is much more messy and dynamic. And so we brought team coaches and leaders out onto the ship where we couldn't plan everything. And um, I think it was very revealing, at least to me, I don't know if you would concur, Gabe, how we are so dependent on structure that um, like when you strip people out of that curation and structure how people's anxieties like go through the roof and we're not as flexible and nimble as we'd Mm -hmm. like to think we are. And um, so so I I do. Yeah, I can't resist. What was the biggest reveal to each of you around (laughs) what it you know, what the experience was for you being in this unstructured environment? I know you guys were, you know, in kind of lead roles, but there would have been times when when you weren't, you handed over the reins to to somebody else. So Mm. Cher, tell us all the juicy goss. What did wow. it reveal to you? What did it reveal to you about yourself that you're willing to share? I have an answer to that, Gabe. But I, if you're if you're ready to go, I do. Uh, I'll, I'll just say uh, um, the, the the word needs came up. Um, you know, you're um, when I think of intervening in, in systems, like you, you asked, what does a system need, or what do we need from each other? But also acknowledging the individual need. Yeah. as well and what so I, I, me need? coming yeah coming to grips with what i need as far as sort of validation or whatever and what i do but then also acknowledging that if a group gets together whether they name it or not there's a need that exists right mm-hmm. around it needing to know about itself or it wanting something that it can't express and so thinking about needs that are uh, listening for one your own needs and then listening for needs and helping groups and systems reveal that is actually the starting point for, you know, eventually working together. Mm. But until you can't even, until you acknowledge how who you are and what you want and what a group wants, there really is no starting. I mean, you can give them a piece of work and they'll they won't coalesce around it. Yeah. Lovely. And Christopher, for I you. Think for me, you know, it's interesting because I'm kind of you know critiquing this thing around structure. Uh, And I'm a person who's really about vision and like the visualization and dreaming of what we're going to create. But then I have a deep need for plans and structure and coaching has been super helpful. And becoming a coach is really helpful to learn to let go of the plan. Um, And I always like to quote whenever I work with a team, it's kind of a qualifier. I always quite quote this Eisenhower um, statement, you know, that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. So I love to have a plan, but I think as I've gotten more experience, learning to let go of the plan and even throw the plan out the window. Um, mm. But on the ship, that for me, because I was, um, you know, partially, I was financially responsible for the voyage and a holding a lot. And I remembered the first voyage we went on. So being out on a ship out in the ocean for people who have never been out is really exhilarating. And so they re- it, it's like a fantasy for the first couple of days. But what oftentimes happens is reality comes crashing down. So you're living in this ideal state. And it's a classic group dynamics trajectory where the team goes up on this high and then the reality of what they got themselves into, <laughs> being out on the boat, some people getting seasick, like they go down and then they get angry 
because they handed over their authority to you in the in the rise. Now the opposite, they reclaim their authority and it's like the risk of mutiny is real. <laughs> so those movies like the mutiny on the bounty and all that is like coming real. And like we're holding the space dealing with these psychological forces. And so when uh, I was on the, the voyage with Gabe, I had trauma from the first voyage, you know, and then usually what happens is so the team goes up on a high, then they get angry and hate you. <laughs> and then slowly, you know, you find a pathway out on the voyage, right? So when we were going on the second trip and, and I knew the, the reality was going to come crashing in and they were going to start to hate us as the facilitators, you know, just trusting that we were going to get through it. I had to get over my own trauma from the past and just trust that I was there and that together we would find a way. And it was really about letting go of control. And so I think that's kind of a thing. Interesting dance using that dance metaphor as human beings. Mm -hmm. We have a need for stability, but we also have a need for change. And mm -hmm. um, ideally we'd be right on the cusp of those two things, but mm -hmm. it's easy to get pulled on one of those extremes. And more mm -hmm. often we get pulled to the structure side because mm -hmm. when there's structure, our anxiety levels come down. But I don't know. I think that's the big was the big lesson for me. And really the whole purpose of being out on this ship was to let go of our dependence on order to embrace change, to embrace uncertainty, all that VUCA stuff, which we all love to quote. But actually, the reality is we can only handle a little bit bit of VUCA in reality, like our our containers mm. as human beings. We need to stretch those. And yeah. I mean, I think that's what's awesome about team coaching and this work we do is we get to really work on stretching ourselves as human beings individually yeah. in relationships as you know collectives. So that's kind of what keeps me in this. Like it, there's so much personal growth in this. Right. It reminds me, Krista, one of the things what we do is what, what Gabe like. At the end of our engagement, in the first day, if it's a day and a half, you know, we'd reflect on the day and we'd say, what was most useful today, but what's most important for tomorrow? And quite often, what's most important for tomorrow is different to what would have been in the plan. And you got to just pivot right yeah. away and you got to do what's most important for tomorrow for the team. So being willing to, to do that is huge. But Chris, I have a question just on the, being out on a ship and it was mm. team coaches primarily on, or even in its And some right? leaders, some team leaders. Yeah, team mostly co team coaches though. Yeah. How like how did um as team coaches helping teams work more collaboratively and cohesively and perform better with all these people on a ship? Should have been the best performing ship in the world, right? You know? Well <laughs> I, 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 I'll, I'll, be, that's yeah. what you would Never like worked to think, right? It's, it's actually I mean I think the 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 program was the most the fact that team coaches mostly don't work together. I mean they try right. to. They're solopreneurs more. The, the, the motivation for, for Chris pulling us together is because we need, we need to understand the being, the being of a team member uh, more deeply than even just our dyads and, yes. and whatever. Cause we were really like five people, six people, and then four teams of teams. Um, the answer is no, they were not the best. They were, uh, they had all, they had all of his, moments of excellence, <laughs> all the moments, all of the positive <laughs> and negative moments that every other team in the world uh, would have. Uh, Chris, you use the, uh, the uh, metaphor, that the cobbler's shoe uh, kids have no shoes. Uh, it, it's hard <laughs> for us uh, to, to practice what we preach sometimes and have to be able to be self aware uh, of our roles and teams because uh, we're outside a lot of time. Yeah. Well, guys, we've been burning the daylight here in this podcast, and I think we should probably start to bring it down to a, a conclusion. I'd love to get a closing comment from everybody. Maybe I'll just kick it off. One is, um, love having you guys on. I think if you haven't published some of the cases you've been working on, um, the field really could benefit from these more team of teams cases. I think for a lot of coaches out there, we grapple with one team at a time. Um, but really learning to, that's not the end goal. I think the end goal is we need to reach a critical mass of teams that are mm. having potential impact for shifting organizational cultures and outcome, other outcome, important outcomes, performance and the like. So anyway, so if you guys haven't written about your cases, would love to urge you to do so um, because I think it's something that the field needs and we need more modeling of demystifying work with multi-team mm. systems. So uh, would just make that plug for you guys if you haven't already. I know, Stephen, you have a podcast, Live Unbound, so people can check that out. I'll put your um, LinkedIn bios back up here. Um, but maybe we'll go uh, Melissa next, and then uh, we'll go to Gabe and then um, Stephen. Just final comments, 
reflections from today, inspiration, parting advice, anything you want to say here to be complete for today's conversation? For me, I, I feel the conversation is brought into focus in a really nice way, starting off with the, the conversation around, um, you know, leadership and followership and then getting into uh, the hurling conversation. The comp- it really highlighted the complexities that are going on at any one time in the system and really being mindful of, um, you know, the ecosystems within which teams are, are sitting, but also recognizing that when we show up as a pair of team coaches or in other engagements, I'm sure you'll need to bring in pairs of team coaches because you'll have so many uh, teams in the mix the importance of us not letting ourselves off the hook Mm -hmm. for good quality teaming and we got into some of that so we heard a lot about your you know pre-intervention and maybe your post-intervention processes in terms of all the planning you do pre intervention Mm. the debriefing that you do uh after each session um but then the importance of you know how do we deal with that relationship in real time in a way that's useful for the team to see it and not to shy away from that Mm. um because we're not always going to turn up perfectly in sync uh, no matter how much we work with with somebody else there's always going to be moments where you know that cohesion slips away from us a little bit and how we respond to that. So Mm -hmm. that's really for me what today has been a lovely illustration of the layering, the layers and layers Mm -hmm. and layers that go on in in the work that we do and the part that we play uh, when we're in another another person's organization. Mm -hmm. Um, So thank you both. It's been really, it's been really really lovely. Yeah. 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 Gabe. Yeah. You know, um, I'm going to circle back to the, the, the to the, my beginning comments around intention and and connection, and I, I think what I what I found ultimately is that um, if you are curious in a group or a system, you're curious enough to reveal what's disconnected. You're going to find yourself in a team of teams engagement. Mm. You're going to find that there's people not in the room that are needed to help you accomplish your goals, your aspirations to satisfy a stakeholder, whatever. So I think that curiosity will lead you there. Then the question is, once you reveal itself to yourself, what do you do about it? It's going to be scary. Like, oh my gosh, I, no, we don't need to go there. We're not contracted to do that. We're not allowed to talk to those people. But if that's if that's somewhere you want to go, I promise you it'll reveal itself to you. Because um, I think that's what's needed. Rarely do we just deal with one team and say, oh, every, everything you need and all the problems you have are contained in the seven people right now. That's usually never the case. Like it would be, they wouldn't need us if that was the case. Uh, and then, so once we re- discover something disconnected, then w- then what are we doing intentionally about it? Like, are we intentionally ignoring it? That's fine too. Like, that's a you know organizational defense mechanism. We just will intentionally ignore it, or we or we can acknowledge it and then try and intentionally do something about it. So, uh, just bring back to that theme of we talked about dance before, but having that dance between connection and tension knowing when the right time is to discover, when, when the right time is to act, um, and doing it with somebody that's helping you make sense of this of this, this work that can be scary, can be threatening, um, puts you on learning's edge at any moment. Um, so just in great appreciation for uh, the connections we have, uh, Krista and Melissa, and the work that uh, Ben and Stephen, because this work is inspiring and we're helping other people achieve purpose um, and that, that align with our values. And I think that's how I'm, perceive making my impact in the world yeah love that, gabe. lovely gabe Stephen. Okay. just following on from gabe's point i think you know it's it's um it's amazing to do this work and mm. to to support people and teams to to feel their best and do their best it's 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 amazing but it's um you it, it happens at the age you know and that comes back to i suppose the team as well i felt all of today was being at your age and in the stretch zone and, and that's where the most impact is had but your mm-hmm. willingness to go there and it it look different for different people but your willingness to, to step in there 
um, is is I think even in life, I think that's where the best of life exists. You know, so I think um, yeah, you know, that's the job we do. We have to role model that. So I just want to want to call that out, and I just want to thank um, Christopher and Melissa as well for the invitation. Um, you know, again, you're you're really good role models even to me in in the work you do, and I want to just call that out as well. You're doing exceptional work, and Christopher, you know, we supervision couple of years back and it was i learned so much in those in those moments and then mm. for many reasons and it was amazing so a lot of what i what i'm even doing now is still referencing back to those to those times and i just want to thank gabe as well for his um continuing you know support and our work together and we're doing you know every day we, we get better and i think that's another aspect of even team effectiveness continuous learning and Love i think that. We're, we're at the edge together so i think to yeah. be at the edge is amazing but to be at the edge together is even better again so that's seek beautiful. those moments seek those moments is, is what i'd yeah. say yeah we're all Stephen, on this journey together learning together right yeah Stephen, the next time you're in the the real capital oh. <laughs> you're right back for sure melissa that's in the next um yeah don't worry we, we call it by july i'll we'll sit down in person and have a cup of tea yeah for sure look forward to it look forward to it christo well, you need to come over as well christo i know well. i know I will have to make my way over there to mediate um, <laughs> my Irish brethren. <laughs> but folks, thank you all for tuning in today. For the listeners, um, you know you can listen to all the episodes at team team dash coaching dash zone dot teachable dot com. You can also um, Google Team Coaching Zone; it'll redirect you there. Um, and we'd love to see you in the LinkedIn group. We've got the Team Coaching Learning Community on LinkedIn, so would love to uh, see you guys in conversation there. And you know we are here every. Friday at this time for these team coaching learning conversations. If there's people you'd love to see on this show, we are, you know, constantly looking for good individuals and groups of people to bring on. And uh, yeah, let's continue the learning, keep evolving the field. And, you know, the demand out there is great. And uh, I think the supply of people who can do this work is, is low. So there's lots of room for all of us. So I think together we can uh, make a dent in the universe of team coaching for sure. So Gabe and Steven, Great to have you on, Melissa. Great to be in dialogue with you as well. And uh, we'll see you guys next time on the Team Coaching Zone. Everybody have a great Thank day. Thank you so much. Take care. See you later, yeah. guys. Bye now. See you soon, guys. Take see care. Bye-bye. See ya.